Um, I'm Beata. I lead the small boutique consulting company in uh, in London. Quite recently, I have published the first book with Wiley regarding the asset liability management optimization, uh, where I show exactly how to optimize through the numerical optimization techniques, how to optimize the banking book of a bank. When I'm saying optimization of the banking book, I consider the minimization of the funding cost on a funding on the liability side, and I consider the maximization exercise of the income on the asset side of the banking book. So those two, for me, in this presentation, are optimization, uh, are optimization dimensions. So we will be going through the optimization of the funding base, minimization through the minimization of the funding cost, and maximization of the profitability of your asset. Uh, let me tell you that why this optimization concept is so uh, so common recently. You have heard many times for sure, uh, opt let's optimize the capital base, let's optimize the, um, the lab liquid asset buffer, let's optimize everything in a bank. But what exactly it mean? Um, I quite I didn't I haven't seen many publications or many exercises performed in a bank where you can come up with the clear optimization process which is embedded in the asset liability management uh, structure framework. And uh, in my view, it should be a must. Uh, I would like to refer. Uh, to some uh, consideration and thoughts which uh, already has been expressed by Professor Murat Chanri many times uh, through his strategic ILM and integrated bank balance sheet management. He states, and I fully agree with this statement, that the future of a bank is the integrated risk management. So there is this integrated approach applied to the financial risk management in ILM department when we try to minimize the exposure to the uh, to the interest rate risk and liquidity risk at, at the same time we are trying to to minimize funding base to minimize the uh, the cost of funds on the funding base and to maximize the profitability of your asset so we can already see how strong relationship in this ilm strategic ilm the new trend in a banking which is arising <clears throat> is with business unit between business units itself and between ilm um because quite recently, historically, uh, you know, the ILM um, was uh, considered on a silo basis, so it inherited all exposure coming from the uh, business units, and it had only the the main task was to um, uh, to manage those risks in order to achieve the immunity or close to immunity exposure to the risks financial risks now ilm is evolving it is no more ilm which has been static and reactive here we will be talking about the new trend in ilm so the active proactive ilm let's call it like uh, Professor Murat coined it, a strategic LM, which is the fundamental element of, uh, uh, of a bank. And it is an engine of the profitability. So let's uh, start our webinar. And today we'll be talking about uh, the role of ILM. Then I will walk you through the interest rate risk management in the banking book. And we'll do some quick case study. I will introduce this case study. And then uh, I will ask you to solve it by yourself. Whenever you have a question or you would like to check it, please contact me after the webinar.
Uh, during the second part, we'll be talking about uh, liquidity, we'll be talking about funds transfer pricing, and then we will go through the optimization exercise and I will show you how the uh, objective function is built and how the constraints function is built in the optimization exercise. We have quite many slides here. We have 154 slides. So obviously, in the two hours time frame, I'm not able to, um, to go through it in detail, but I will leave it to you, uh, leave it with you to go through it in detail and to analyze and to raise questions and to write to me. And please let me know if you would like to have any other webinar which uh, is related to any specific topic which you came up with and you would like to tackle. So let's start. First of all, uh, the role of this active uh, management of the banking book um, in banking industry is constantly growing. This is something which I've noticed and which is a fact. The traditional approach to asset liability management practice, which operated as this active process, uh, following product origination by the customer um, facing business, is no longer viable. This is because we have the um, uh, we have the Basel three and four era, and we have the margin compression. We have many things which has happened in the in the industry. So definitely, we saw such as negative rates. Uh, it is something unusual in in banks. And coming from this margin compression, we see impact on the bank's profitability. So for sure banks has come up with something in order to maximize the competitiveness and maximize profits. Otherwise, the business will not be viable anymore. So uh, we will focus on this uh, emphasis. This session will focus on the emphasis of ILM, uh, which is the all encompassing discipline and one that should be at heart of all bankers and particular executive uh, committee. So this time the, um, the ALCO members and uh, the board of directors needs to think about ILM as uh, in a different way. So historically, Interest rates were stable and liquidity war was readily available to banks in uh, developed nations. So banks focus primarily on gathering assets and um, there was um, increased growth, there was asset momentum. Uh, however, in the 1970s, changes in regulation, inflation and geopolitics led to greater volatility and thus increase risk, from which came from the mismatches between asset and liabilities. This led to the development of the ILM unit as a formal discipline, uh, where both sides of the balance sheet are integrated in order to manage interest rate, market, liquidity, exchange risk, counterparty risk, all and capital, not immediately, but later, it came also under the regime, under the task mandate of ILM. Um, this discipline, however, remained reactive. So in the nature that, um, in nature with treasury and risk, which had little or no input to the origination or deposit rising process. So definitely it was the silo-based approach uh, as far as business units are concerned. So they were originating, there were no uh, interaction uh, between ILM and business units which could inform uh, ILM or ILM could inform the business units would, what would be the best uh, term of the funding, what would be the best, um, uh, if possible, the best uh, basis, uh, basis uh, factor, uh, market factor, uh, risk factor on the asset side, for example, should it uh, be a LIBOR one month or LIBOR three months or LIBOR six months, what is the best tenor uh, of repricing for our asset side. This is something which uh, which a business unit asset center could easily 
um, define and improve. Uh, the same because not everything is obviously possible uh, when you are talking about some asset class. You cannot easily change it or adjust it. You have just to uh, compete with the market. But uh, for example, on the liability side, it is quite, quite easy to adjust the uh, the funding structure to the for the needs of the bank in order to make it more profitable so as i said traditionally ilm was defined by uh, four main concepts i would say the first one is the liquidity which can be divided by um, uh, short-term liquidity, which is, uh, um, let's say, ease which assets can be converted into the into cash. So we call it as a liquidity risk or counterbalancing capacity of a bank. And then we have the funding risk, uh, which is the continuous ability to maintain funding for all assets. And this is the... Uh, the term which is related to the structural liquidity, to the balance in the bank between a medium long-term asset and stable funding. So the bank needs to make sure that there is sufficient amount of uh, stable funding, which is funding the uh, medium long-term asset, so illiquid asset. And volatile funding, where is which is always in the, at some extent in the bank, which is uh, limited to certain extent because it's volatile. So it exposes the bank to the funding gap. So it has to be managed carefully. Then we have obviously the term structure of interest rates. So the shape of the yield curve at any given time, which depends on interest rate expectations, which depends on the liquidity preference and supply and demand from different borrowers and lenders. And ILM strategy here would consider how changes to the shape of the yield curve in the short and medium term will impact the bank. And the maturity profile of the banking book. So ILM would report and monitor the maturity of all assets and liabilities to measure and control risk. Uh, we know that uh, we have this uh, maturity ladder, which is uh, contractual or behavioral, and the bank which needs to uh, which needs to make sure that there is no exceeded maturity transformation and the, uh, the funding gap are well managed and are within the limits. Then we have the interest rate risk repricing profile of the bank, essentially the risk of loss of the net interest income due to adverse movements in interest rates or interest rate spread. Interest rates, uh, interest rate spreads, for example, uh, as I said here, we will see later we have different IRBB categories. We have the basis risk, and this is exactly what we mean when we are saying this interest rate risk spreads, because they are mm, a different uh, the, the discrepancy in movement between different risk factor, you for one month, you for three months, and uh, you know they are not perfectly correlated. So if they move um, by different amounts up and down, it can affect your basis risk of the bank. Um, basis risk arise from different sources, but about this we'll be talking a bit later. And then there will be separate webinar on the IRBB, which explains in detail uh, IRBB risks because it's hot topic recently and IRBB is becoming uh, one of the um, heavy regulated risks uh, together with credit risk and liquidity risk. Uh, this is because it is, uh, it is so important to, to be well managed. And um, let's explain before a bit uh, a bit in more in detail so um, what is in scope of ILM so you can see on this slide 
that you have the LM and capital management. Exactly. There's also capital which needs to be managed under the task, under the remit of ILM. So a key focus uh, for banks is managing capital, funding, liquidity, interest rate risk requirements. And this all, you can see is on the slide, they fall under the umbrella of the LM. And when a bank borrows more than it needs, there can be inefficiency in terms of capital use. So this is why capital is also under remit of ILM. So this also can also result in added interest rate risk and a loss when lending on. So failure to have a sufficient liquidity, however, um, uh, results in the bank having to rely on central bank liquidity, poor market perception, loss of investors, which could ultimately lead to failure. So um, LM becomes the most important aspect in a bank's risk management framework. And as you can see, all those risks um, are correlated together. So um, let's uh, talk a bit about the silo management which uh, what exactly what does exactly mean silo management in um, in ILM which had been witnessed since 90, 1970s consider it in exactly how ILM is uh, undertaken uh, in virtually every bank today irrespective of size business model location, a business line in a bank following an understood medium term strategy, uh, which is articulated explicitly or implicitly. In reality, we know that it has to meet the year end budget target, uh, goes out and originate customers business uh, and originate asset and raising liabilities, because this is exactly the role. Uh, of a bank. It would most likely have little interaction with any other business line and only mm, the formal review interaction with risk department. So, for example, I was uh, quite uh, often when I, uh, in my past, in my experience uh, as an ILM manager, I was asked quite often, you know, what is the impact on the this particular funding structure on interest rate risk exposure of the bank. The problem was um, that this funding structure has already been established, has already been defined, and by the end, the, um, the treasurer has come up and asked uh, what was the impact on the uh, on the fundings, on the interest rate risk profile, what is the maturity in a repricing gap, what is the exposure yield risk coming from this structure. So it was too late. This, this process needs to be done uh, simultaneously at the same time. Uh, treasurer, um, head of uh, interest rate risk in the banking book, they need to sit together and analyze uh, Ex ante, what is the impact on the certain funding structure on the IRBB profiling? And unfortunately, this is still uh, this still quite uh, we see the the silo base, the silo mentality uh, in the organization, and it is typical of all, but not very smallest banks. In some banks, uh, an individual business line may have practically zero interaction with treasury and each of these business lines will proceed to undertake business um, as a part of a grand strategy intertwined with other business lines but in reality to a certain extent in isolation and the action of all these customer facing desk in the bank will then give rise to a balance sheet which must be risk managed instead of a bank which is proactive and profit based. And the ILM part of this risk management process is undertaken by Treasury in 
conjunction with uh, finance and risk in order to uh, to have it more integrated. There is still little or no interaction between business lines and a little or no influence of treasury function. Um, instead, in other words, ILM is a reactive, after the fact process. The balance sheet shape and structure is arrived at is not by accident, certainly not by active design, and certainly not as the result of a process that integrates asset and liabilities origination. So the people charged with stewarding the balance sheet through the economic cycle and market crashes have very little to do with creating the balance sheet in the first place. So um, does it represent best practice risk management discipline with separation of duties, uh, the free lines of defense, or so on? In my view, no. There is uh, no problem with one department originating asset and another one managing the risk on them. The issue with the traditional approach to LM is that the balance sheet that is arrived at often lacks a coherent shape or logic, and this makes this risk management of it more problematic. In the era of Basel III, it is evident that balance sheet management must become more proactive. So, uh, quite simple, the discipline of ILM must recognize the asset origination and liability rising to, has to be connected. So, for the ILM process to be fit for purpose for the 21st century, banks must transition and adapt from a transitional reactive ILM process to a proactive strategic ILM process which operate in multi dimensional balance sheet uh, optimization ocean. And this is something on which we focus right now. Uh, so let's first of all um, explain um, the process of the matched maturity transformation of a bank, which uh, is something uh, which we're witnessing right now as a best practice for the funds transfer pricing and for the uh, structure of ILM in a bank. So bank ILM uh, works as a bank within a bank. So you see this, uh, it sits in the middle between the asset center, which provides loans to clients and liability center, which gathers funds from depositors. And ILM in this picture is, um, is working uh, gathering funds from the liability center and providing those funds to the asset center. So it manages the funding of whole bank. And there is the FTP process, which is a fundamental part of this, uh, of this exercise because the ILM pays to the liability centers or recognize to liability center the FTP rate for those funds, which has been raised from depositors, which have been raised from depositors, and it pay its charge the asset center through the FTP rate. So asset center is paying the FTP rate to ILM, uh, which uh, for the funds which it received. So this whole structure is, as you can see, integrated and based on the FTP rate and based on the FTP curve. So uh, this is matched maturity uh, because we see that business units in this model are uh, immune to any financial risk. The exposure to financial risk in this picture um, is completely closed. And I spoke about this particular um, design um, in the F funds transfer pricing webinar, uh, where we have analyzed what does it mean, this immunization of the different uh, business units and why there is necessary to, it is necessary to transfer interest rate risk and 
funding risk uh, to ILM and also liquidity risk through OLAB for charging out the uh, liquid asset buffer costs to business units. And why? And I will show uh, some example how it has to be done, the methodology of charging out the call, cost of liability to uh, from ILM to business unit. It has been all uh, analyzed in the funds transfer pricing webinar. So here, I will only focus on <clears throat> to uh, highlight that in this process, we keep the uh, business units immune uh, to the interest rate risk and liquidity risk and ILM uh, keeps and manage the whole maturity transformation and interest rate risk exposure. There is also the effects exposure, the counterparty risk, and it is all managed in ILM. And as such, ILM is making some spread if it's working as a, a profit center. If not, this uh, this spread is distributed uh, to the business unit uh, through the certain process of distribution allocation of the ILM profit to the within the bank uh, if it is working as a service center. If it's working as a profit center, then this ILM spread remains here and it is the profit of the ILM. So ILM here will be the business unit. So it's important, extremely important to make this difference between um, the ILM, which works as a service unit and ILM, which works as a profitability unit. And then we have the commercial spread on the asset side, in this case, which is 2.69 and deposit spread, which here for this illustrative purpose is negative. And again, I explain all this uh, when the product is value destroying, when the product is value uh, value adding for the bank. So it is obviously I skip this part here and I will move on. Uh, we see again the maturity transformation, which is the um, the main source of found uh, of uh, profit for the bank. Uh, we know that around um, sixty percent of the total net interest income is uh, is done through um, through uh, credit differential, but there is also. 20%, around 20%, which is made through maturity transformation. It means that uh, all, every single bank run some uh, maturity transformation. And in terms of the interest rate exposure, we call it riding the yield curve. So every single bank, to some extent, rides the yield curve and keep some maturity transformation. It is some portion and the bank of the total net interest income of the bank, and the bank has its own appetite towards extent of the maturity transformation and towards the riding the yield curve in terms of IRBB exposure, which is definitely described if the, in the IRBB policy, in the liquidity policy, and which is approved by the ALCO committee and board of directors. Uh, but um, it is important that we see uh, how it, how this uh, maturity transformation here arise. So we can see that asset retail mortgage in this particular example has maturity of three years and it is founded by um, a retail current account, which contractually has the maturity of overnight. So we can see this huge uh, maturity transformation between the asset side and liability side because the maturity of asset is longer than the maturity of the liability. And within this, the FTP process uh, <clears throat> slightly, um, you know, in, div divides this profit, the total NIM net interest margin of the bank. So it's allocated to different business units. So here, some portion will be through FTP allocated to the asset center, some portion will be allocated to the liability center, and some portion is gained by ILM. So without FTP, 
we wouldn't see this uh, separation. We wouldn't see exactly how profitable are our asset side and products within asset side and within liability side and how much ILM has gained for the bank. This is again um, the ILM, which is zero sum uh, game exercise, extremely important concept um, because um, it is mostly related to the funds transfer pricing uh, because FTP has to be fair and transparent and it is not supposed um, to, ILM is not supposed to mark up uh, according to its own um, uh, according to its own uh, willingness, um, the FTP, which is uh, uh, charged on the loan, on the asset, and which is uh, uh, all marked down, for example, the FTP on the liability side. It is important that ILM is applying the correct, the exact FTP rate, so there is no gain and there's no um, profit which is made by application of the additional marks up on marks down to the FTP rate without any formal approval of ALCO committee or the or the strategic as a plan of the strategic co uh, program or strategic exercise within the bank because it obviously can happen and then this there is the markup on the FTP rate uh, or markdown so malus or bonus for certain products but it is all decided uh, at the bank level it is not decided by ILM itself. So here ILM must work as a zero-sum game uh, unit so they don't earn anything on through marking up artificially FTP from on the asset side and liability side. This is uh, this is meant by this com and by this uh, concept which for sure you have ha you have heard many times ILM zero sum game uh, it is quite common concept and then uh, let's start going through the different um, concept of uh, ILM mm, so terms within ILM like liquidity risk interest rate risk and effective balance sheet management so what does it mean effective balance sheet management it basically answered the question, those different questions which are I summarize for you here. For example, <clears throat> one of those questions is, uh, are we borrowing too much from money market? So this is a typical question which is, uh, which is uh, put to ILM consideration. ILM has to answer this question. And will it run out of capital? Another question, which is within the remit of ILM. How much do we hold as a buffer of liquid asset? And is it too much? Is it too low? This is again part of the ILM remit. Um, does it, does our banking book, so does it meet all the regulatory requirements? Obviously it has to, uh, but it is ILM task to make sure that, for example, liquidity metrics, IRBB metrics, um, are within the limits. A risk management is the second line of defense, so they obviously will calculate those metrics, uh, but uh, and rise. The, they will rise hand when there is some risk of uh, of uh, reaching those limit or threshold triggers. But basically, ILM has to be aware of those regulatory requirements, those regulatory limits. So when they uh, undertake an a an strategy or hedging strategy or whatever funding strategy, they need to uh, keep in consideration that they are outside their requ regulatory strict requirements which the bank needs to abide by. And does it depend too much on swapping deposit in one currency to found loans in another currency? A typical uh, question which is raised by ILM because obviously uh, there is multi-currency word and we have the material currency. Uh, currencies by material currencies we mean the currencies which have 5% 
uh, or more of total asset uh, base. Um, so it's um, quite significant. They have to be treated uh, on the separate basis. So all analysis for the liquidity, for LCR, for NSFR, for interest rate risk has to be done separately for those uh, currencies, material currencies. And then um, as far as liquidity is concerned, uh, this is quite a good tool, which I would like to share with you, of uh, optimizing the funding base based only on the qualitative approach. So we don't introduce here any quantitative approach, uh, which we'll be introducing later. But here we see only on the funding base, which is optimized according to one criteria. And this criteria is LCR. And it is answering the question how much the certain funding source is LCR friendly. And you can see that the green part is indicating that the product funding is efficient funding and is LCR friendly. And the orange, uh, yellow, and uh, red color um, introduce how it is worsening. So different stages of worsening in terms of LCR-friendly products. For example, we know that if you want to found, we'll, this is the type of liabilities. So we have the senior, uh, medium term notes. Uh, here we have the retail depot, so like CASA current accounts, savings accounts, and time depot. So they are, we can see that they are uh, inefficient deployment of quality deposits because obviously retail deposits are very good quality deposit if we want, for example, to found the cash through those, um, through those funding and or trading book or a trading book financial institution asset with maturity, so volatile assets with maturity of less, uh, lower than one month. It is obviously mm, not good. And uh, it's good instead, this is efficient funding as far as commercial asset and uh, with maturity of higher than one year or equal or even for the commercial asset with lower than one year maturity. So this is efficient funding. So here you have the asset side and different asset structure, asset compositions after asset categories. And here you can see uh, the funding and answer. You can just answer looking for the different uh, at the different point of this matrix. You can see is it efficient or inefficient cost of funds. So this is typical, uh, very good in my view, qualitative um, optimization of the funding structure and many banks apply those qualitative appro approaches in order to optimize the funding structure. Um, and then we have the uh, interest rate risk side of the banking of the banking book. 